Alright, um, so being my birthday month and written since I've landed from the UK, this story was written in lots of bits and pieces and could be a little bit interesting. We'll see. The topics were inexplicable changes of direction, people changing really fast and the complications therein, privatisation of public transport and the complications caused therein, <laughs> failed knitting projects and motorways, where's the exit? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a little poem called Change, which is just about stuff that changes. Some leopards do change their spots, painting them with dust or covering with shade. With ever-changing flux, our cells are new, so I wonder if even the spotted leopard is the same. Pieces recycled and tumbled and filtered go round in this world endlessly, and we're only the pieces that fall into place in a certain way. And yet, at our core, is something we know, something we say is the I growing out of an ever-changing soil, a solidity fused by our minds. Mm. So this story is called Changing Coat. It all started when the local government in Betty, Barb and Bryn State decided to privatise the public transport. Every week for three years, the three neighbours have met at the little bus stop on their street and got the bus to the shop, dry cleaner, hairdresser, and sometimes, when all their errands will run early, the cinema. Some nice birds. <laughs> On the bus, they would knit and complain about the new hotel. The new hotel was built about the time Betty and Matt moved in, and ever since its arrival, <laughs> it's dusk. <laughs> it's very loud on the sound mm. Ever since its arrival, there had been ever such strange crowds in town congregating around it. Betty, Barb and Bryn saw them out of the bus window as the bus passed down the main road. I can't be doing with those steampunk folks, Betty announced on one such occasion. <laughs> All that complicated costume gear, some of it so skimpy, and for what? Barb looked down her nose over the rim of the reading glasses she needed for knitting nowadays. That's a very old lady thing to say, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> we are old ladies, Betty returned. We can talk like this now. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Betty's said old lady things her whole life, though, Bryn interjected. Right, Betty? She glanced down at her knitting. Oh, you nincompoop. <laughs> Betty gave her a look. Bryn sighed. Do you think we reach a certain age and just suddenly come out with these words our grandmothers said? She asked, trying to redeem a large hole formed of dropped stitches. I saw an entire crowd at that darned hotel last week, made up entirely of dentists, declared Barb. That's much worse than steampunk if you ask me. It's such an ugly newfangled building, Betty complained for the 104th week in a row. Bryn gave up on her holy tangle and the discussion of old lady language and began pulling the yarn off the needles to start again. Well, I don't care what it looks like, but I wish they'd not used those megaphones in the entrance foyer. Ella can dratted well hear the things from home and she doesn't half go on about it. Matt can't hear them at all, said Betty. He didn't even hear when their alarm was going off for an hour last week. He's deaf as a door now, he is. In March that year, however, the buses became the property of a company called Tinnies. The name alone seemed to irritate Barb, who referred to them as those sods. <laughs> Tinnies determined that as only three local citizens boarded the bus on Willow Court, the bus need not turn up this street anymore and could instead collect the residents of Willow Court, Almond Avenue and Primrose Drive from a point further up the main road. This meant that Betty, Barb and Bryn had to pass by the dry cleaners, the hairdresser and the shops in order to get to the bus stop, such that it was easier to walk to most of their destinations. 
they also had to pass by the new hotel. It took a very long time to get from their homes to the dry cleaner and laundromat on foot, especially when carrying large parts of their wardrobe. Betty had taken to twin sets and dry clean only suits the day after her 65th, yeah. <laughs> so trips to the dry cleaner were frequent and awkward. Bryn had recently acquired some brightly coloured quilted patchwork covers for her assortment of drums and rare instruments, only to discover that they would not fit in her small washing machine. And so the three of them were to be found one Wednesday morning, edging slowly down the road, Betty's walking frame acting like a beast of burden for a pile of dry cleaning topped with drapings of rainbow patchwork, and the other's arms occupied with shopping trolleys, bags, and coats they were wishing they hadn't worn. Presently, they saw the bus pull up far ahead. Useless blasted thing, muttered Betty, eyeing it angrily. As they watched, the bus took on a single passenger, pulled out and made a U-turn in order to turn up a street on the other side of the road. I'll be dashed, Bryn exclaimed. Why on earth is it going that way? Because those riff rad sods Tinnies don't know how to run a bus, that's why. <laughs> Barb stopped, leaned down very slowly and carefully, and retrieved a hanky that had dropped from the basket under Betty's walker. <laughs> Betty paused, got out her purse, and reapplied some coral lipstick, <laughs> all the while looking very put out. Much later, the three friends were edging their way back in the other direction, the rainbow patchwork of Brynn's instrument bag spread out between the trolleys and walker to air out any remaining damp. Brynn was just declaring that perhaps they should have a sit down at the next bench <laughs> when they rounded a corner and found themselves looking at a large, fancifully dressed crowd outside the new hotel. Oh, bother, it's not that blessed steampunk mob, is it, Betty? <laughs> Squinting. This lot seem less enamoured with cogs and such, Bryn commented, peering ahead. As Betty, Barb and Bryn approached, a young man with a cloak and a probably fake beard peeled off from the group and came towards them. Are you the merchant jester? he inquired of Betty. <laughs> Betty squinted at him. No, sir, I'm 82 years old and have a bum knee and I need a cup of tea, she retorted as though affronted. The young man smiled. Oh, well, you're welcome to come in and get some tea if you like. Betty looked like she wasn't sure what to do. Bryn and Barb looked at one another. What sort of convention or whatever is this? Bryn asked trying to bundle the patchwork covers back up onto the walking frame. We're LARPers, said the young man, drawing himself up as though this statement was very important to his worth. What's that? Betty let go of her walking frame and went right up to the young LARPer, seeming to inspect his beard for authenticity. <laughs> Live action role playing gamers, Bryn told her. <laughs> what? said Betty. Maybe there wasn't much of that sort of thing in your heyday. Brim concentrated, counting decades. Why don't you come in and see a demonstration? asked the young man. One week later, when Brim and Barb got to the corner just past Betty's house, where they'd taken to meeting, they found Betty waiting in a nicely tailored wool coat and jeans. <laughs> <laughs> you all right, Betty? asked Barb. You look like someone else dressed you. <laughs> Betty drew herself up, leaning against a shiny black walking stick instead of her usual walking frame. I'm trying a more modern look, she announced proudly. I have to get used to it as I'm to go to a laugh on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> what? exclaimed Barb. You think the steampunk lot are improper, but you're off to join in with the wizards and gutter snacks. Betty patted her perm. I'm sure the steampunk is quite exciting if you're in amongst it, she murmured, <laughs> gazing excitedly off into the distance. That's a very unold ladylike thing to say, Betty, said Barb. <laughs> On the way to the shops, it seemed to Bryn that Betty was walking faster and more upright, 
and looking somewhat formidable in her long black coat and gloves. Bryn found herself eyeing Betty with caution, unsure whether to talk to her as normal or attempt some sort of special modern patter. <laughs> as they passed the new hotel foyer, a crowd of Donald Trump impersonations <laughs> gave Bryn the shivers. She was glad that Betty's new hobby was something creative and fun. But could Betty really be a laugher? So, Betty, what sort of setting is your LARP game on Sunday based in, she asked, in an attempt to break the ice of this new subject between them. Well, Betty began, lowering her voice conspiratorially, Jason told me it's a London mystery with vampires, but I'm supposed to read the rest of the details on the blasted Facebook event. And I can't see it because the darned mobile phone did something strange overnight. And everything looks weird and I don't know where it is. <laughs> she stopped abruptly so that Barb nearly bumped into her and the three of them spent several moments regaining their balance. Look, Betty turned to her handbag and began removing a small suitcase worth of makeup, scarves, pens, mysterious purses and things that might come in handy in order to locate the large tablet-like mobile phone that she shared with Matt. They all peered at the large screen, squinting in the sunlight. Oh, blast and damnation, half Bryn. Stupid thing has had an update. <laughs> there was a collective groan from Barb and Betty. Give up on the LARPing now, Betty, said Barb. You'll never find Facebook again. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, however, Betty must have located the details of her LARP because on Sunday morning she was seen by Barb from the kitchen window beetling down the street at 6am in a high collared black trench coat and heeled boots. Barb described the outfit to Bryn who deduced that Betty must be playing the part of either a fancy detective or one of the vampires. <laughs> from this day on, Bryn and Barb found themselves seeing less and less of Betty as she disappeared out to LARPs at all hours and all days of the week and was driven about by some new younger friends in all manner of fancy dress who pulled into Willow Court with loud exciting adventure music blasting from the car windows. <laughs> One afternoon, Barb was sitting in Bryn and Ella's garden. This was something she was permitted to do on quiet sunny afternoons if she brought a book and didn't make clicking sounds with knitting needles. <laughs> Ella liked to listen to the bird song and try to mimic the pitch on an ocarina Bryn had bought her. If they were especially quiet, the birds would sometimes come right up to where they sat and sit singing as if they'd mistaken Ella for one of their own. Today though, Ella was unusually talkative. What's going on with that tree, Bryn? she questioned pointing at a wattle which had recently had a large branch cut on the lawn side. Bryn looked a bit concerned. The branch was getting in the way of the washing line, remember? Ella shook her head. No, not that spike head. She affectionately patted the top of Bryn's short cropped hair, which was indeed becoming spikier with age. Look at the other side. That branch has sort of turned the corner. They all got carefully up and went to have a closer look. Is it because the fence is in the way? Suggested Barb. Would the tree know the fence is there before it touches the fence? Ella peered at the branch, which really seemed to have changed its mind and turned a right angled corner part way along. It sort of reminds me of Betty, said Bryn, changing all of a sudden like that. Ella patted the branch and frowned. Are you too worried about her? she asked. Why? Barb retorted. She's just discovered something fun is all. A new lease on life sort of thing. Ella nodded slowly. Hmm. But all the same, poor Matt must not be too pleased. Barb huffed and puffed herself up like a chilly pigeon. God wallop. Poor Matt indeed. Wouldn't you be pleased if Bryn got all excited about a new hobby? Have you looked at Betty lately? Ella turned back to her ocarina and didn't say anything. So Barb took this as an opening for some sage advice. Mm. People, thankfully, are not bus route seller. They can't be owned by anyone. 
nor their direction decided for them. When they change, it's not merely to inconvenience us, but to grow. Bryn nodded in an impressed way. You're sounding like the sage wise woman sort of old lady, Barb. Yes, said Barb. That's because I'm 90 in three days, and you lot are just spring chickens. <laughs> <laughs> All sage words aside, Ella interjected, Betty's never here anymore, and she doesn't like any of the things she used to. How are we or Matt supposed to connect with her? She stood up and looked over Betty's fence. I'm going to move all her garden gnomes and see if she notices. <laughs> Ella, exclaimed Bryn, that's very immature and selfish. Barb shook her head at Ella. No change when you need one is like a motorway with no exit. It can be just as bad as a change that's unexpected and inexplicable, she said sagely. Little did Barb know that these words were rather ironic for Betty, who at this moment was driving an automobile for the first time in a number of years at the encouragement of her new young laughing friends. <laughs> During those years that Betty had been off the road, the motorway between Tears U and the city had undergone rapid and bewildering changes. And thus, despite allowing an hour and a half for the drive, Betty was now, at one hour past the LARP start time, driving past where the city exit should have been for the fourth time, <laughs> looking around wildly for any turning lane or sign that might indicate how to avoid overshooting the city by many miles again. She must have slowed down because someone behind her honked their horn impatiently, and Betty felt under attack. She returned home at eight o'clock that night, having attended only the last hour of the role play and having been much resented by her fellow vampires for her absence in critical interactions. In the morning, Bryn looked out of her window and saw Betty standing in her front yard, looking sad and confused. She had her rose-colored twin set and slacks back on and was looking at a garden gnome which had somehow ended up in a tree wearing a beanie over its head. <laughs> Another of the gnomes was lying at the foot of the tree with an empty wine bottle placed beside it. <laughs> and yet another was standing in the bird bath with an improvised fishing rod. <laughs> Bryn sighed, put on her slippers, and went out to meet Betty. Sorry, Betty dear. I think Ella got a bit jealous of your splendid new friends and made a ploy for attention. Betty shook her head. They aren't really my friends, Bryn. They're just LARPing enthusiasts. And I've got far too old for that sort of thing, haven't I? Boulder Dash, exclaimed Bryn. You made an excellent vampire, if you ask me. Whatever went wrong yesterday to change your mind about it all? Betty explained about the motorway and the disgruntled vampires and the rude other drivers. Well, it sounds to me like that LARPing group just isn't the right fit for you, Bryn said, when Betty was finished. Let's get Barb, she'll know what to do. Though Barb was firmly of the opinion that anything originating at the new hotel was always destined for failure and skullduggery, <laughs> she admitted that the concept of LARPing itself <coughs> seemed rather wonderful. What we need, she told them, is a LARPing group that plays close to home and finishes with plenty of time for a cuppa, a good sit down and a spot of knitting. <laughs> I don't think such a thing exists, said Bryn uncertainly. That's why we shall have to make one, said Bob. And that was how later, LARPing Association of Tears You Elderly Residents <laughs> was formed. Knitting had to be incorporated into the setting in order to get around Ella's specific dislike of the click of knitting needles. So Bryn, Betty and Barb, sometimes accompanied by Matt in Tweed, played the role of historical early European settlers in Australia, shearing, waving some garden cutters and throwing bowls of yarn, and spinning in order to knit their own clothes. Bryn succeeded, after the first month, in making a pair of holy socks and a lopsided hat that gave her a rooster-like crest, whilst the others produced about three quarters of a cable knit jumper each, and Ella interrupted periodically with entertainments 
consisting of absurd poems interspersed with ocarina melodies. <laughs> it was unlikely that later would ever win any awards for action, but the residents of Willow Court discovered an arena for imagination and comfortable change, and in time, no longer felt the need to complain about either the new hotel or Tinny's. One day, Ella interrupted as they sat knitting and speaking in their special settler voices, not to offer an in-character entertainment, but to announce that she was very worried about the garden gnomes, which seemed to have continued to change position and attire of their own accord. Betty sat up and put on her best wise face. Worrying is just praying for what you don't want, Ella, she declared. I don't pray, said Ella. Then you're only praying for what you don't want, Betty replied. That's a very old lady thing to say, <laughs> Betty, Bob told her. I know, said Betty, and she drew herself up proudly. Then she turned her head ever so slightly towards Bryn, so that Ella and Bob couldn't see and winked. Bryn strongly suspected she knew what this meant, but you never could be too sure with these sage elderly laugher types. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.